thank you very much. Um, I'm honoured to be here and I must admit, uh, mainly in, in reference to you, Professor Bashir, um, I first met you when you came to speak at a small workshop in Concord that COAS had organised and your leadership around the difficult issues such as mental health and ethnic communities have always been a mark on me and I really, I'm, I, I speak all the time, I think I'm more nervous now than I've ever been, so anyway. And to all you others as well, there are too many to name and, and I'm conscious of the time, thank you for coming. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Yoram Nation and acknowledge that we're meeting on their land and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, to me, I don't think we can have a multicultural discourse unless we understand the positioning of our first people as a quite unique people in that. And I pay homage to you, Auntie. I would like to acknowledge that um, also here are some of the, the real kind of like stars for me of, of the conference, the ethnic media, which has battled away for many, many years. Um, I think you've already probably seen from the colour of my introduction that I'm both a believer in the importance of multicultural media and an avid supporter of its continuity. I am not going to be impartial here. I am partisan, strongly partisan, and I'll show you why. I speak also from a deep personal experience. This has been my area for 30 unbroken working years and before that as a volunteer working in my own Italian community. And I have seen it, worked with it, understood it, maximised it, cried for it at times in terms of its, its treatment, but I'm here to champion it for you today. The thematic of this session is to consider the challenges facing multicultural media, but in order for me to do this, I need to set this media in its own historical development and context. The approach I will take is a 20-year interview, and the wonderful thing about these 20 years is they're part of me, and the best presentations are the ones that you can reflect that are part of yourself. The multicultural media space has, like the rest of, of media uh, that services the community, changed dramatically over the last 40 years. As such, I'm going to talk to you about 1972, 1992 and 2012. And from this perspective, then make some broader comments around the, the politics and policy which needs to be there to support the multicultural media. 1972, in my subtitle this year, Take What You Can Get. This was the most interesting of times in which the first forays into the mainstream media world started to appear. What had been a media that was totally contained within discrete migrant communities, because we did have our newspapers and some radio, started to bleed into the mainstream. In a policy sense, it was shaped by the assimilationist positions of the time, with the state taking neither responsibility nor interest in this media. It was totally driven by the communities and increasingly by commercial media, who saw a growing market significantly prior to government ever seeing it as part of their responsibility. We had specific language newspapers such as La Fiamma, Il Globo in Melbourne, Neos Cosmos, and a lot of my references will be Australia-wide because this wasn't just happening in Sydney, it was happening right across our, our, our vast land, and a handful of other titles. These papers were supported by the key structures relevant to those communities, the religious orders, the churches, the consulates, and the local ethnic-specific business community. There was no ethnic radio. 2EA and 3A were not even imagined, and the only radio of note was Lena Justin, uh, known in my community as Mamma Lena, who started with one-hour weekly programs on 2SM and then moved to 2CH with a daily program bringing the Italian community of Sydney news from home, music, and a virtual connection. But the media which I remember most, and this is me as a child, was uh, tuning into Channel 10 on Sunday morning. Uh, watching Anne Luciano front the TV program Variety Italian Style. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that every single Italian household was doing the same thing, watching Anne from this magazine style program with Italian singers, travelogues, and Italian cities and regions and broader lifestyle. It was so kitsch. In fact, <laughs> Anne Luciano was Czech. She wasn't even <laughs> Italian, but it didn't matter. And the place in the heart, and I think this is really interesting because I did do some research for the presentation and I went onto the web and I found on that there is a Facebook site called Bring Back Variety Italian Style. <laughs> That was 1972, and as you can see, it came out of the communities. It was about how you maintain life, and regardless of assimilationist positions, the reality is the communities needed to be able to be spoken to, they needed news, and they needed their language understood. 
Let's move forward to 1992, and I'm calling these a multicultural year. The multicultural media landscape at this time was really the embodiment of the prevailing multicultural high tide mark. The National Agenda for Multicultural Australia had been launched in 1989. The role of the state in the provision of services and engagement was well established, and ethnic media were structurally embedded in the area of government communications. They were there. The media was broad and diversifying. The ethnic press was at that stage arguably, arguably at its strongest. The titles at this time numbered over 100. The traditional language groups were both joined and overtaken by the new and emerging languages such as Chinese, in which in 1992 there were four dailies, plus any number of weeklies or monthlies. I think I calculated once 25 titles serving the Chinese community in 1992. There was an increasing competition between these titles and these markets with many communities having a choice of titles and the claims that you guys made about your readership were extraordinary. <laughs> I never knew that we had 10 million Chinese people at the time. <laughs> The ethnic press was sustained by a policy position in which 5% of media spend at the Commonwealth level and equally at the state levels of Victoria and New South Wales was allocated to ethnic press and the press was a preferred media for government communication. It was this year also that the tax office inserted a fully translated tax pack in the ethnic press as its key tax time communication strategy. So you pick up La Fiamma and the middle pages were the tax pack in Italia. 1992, I, because we have gone backwards. This is going to be my premise. We've gone backwards. Radio was burgeoning, with SBS having developed beyond 2EA and 3A with a national broadcast network across 40 plus languages and a local service in both Sydney and Melbourne. This was supplemented by the proliferation of ethnic broadcasting on community radio, the development of narrowcast networks using single frequency receivers. This meant that a community could actually broadcast to itself, sell the receivers, and they had a fixed um, audience. In fact, two of our radio stations, 2CR and 2AC, still use this as their, their preferred method. The development of narrow casts and the first uh, free-to-air radio in Melbourne for the Greek community. At this time, TV was indeed the poor cousin. As a consequence of the decision made by SBS in 1989, SBS TV did not broadcast in languages other than English between the hours of 4.30 and 9.30. It was a lote-free zone. And people don't realise it. And this was before we got the down, the, if you like, the downstream news broadcasts coming from overseas, which are now there, and the proliferation of other channels. So at 1992, it was radio and press. SBS was very, very good in things like the world news and the soccer. But apart from that, it wasn't the vehicle that we needed. So that was 1992. Let's now move to two years ago. And, and I needed a two-year period because I needed to reflect about what it actually meant. I do not think that I've been as detailed about the multicultural media in this period as I have potentially in the other ones I've just covered, other than to say that it is in a state of flux and indeed challenged, which, uh, which reflects a broader community media issues. I mean, it is as diversifying as everywhere else, and that's how I've started. My starting point here is that the multicultural media is now far more the result of market considerations than government policy. 1992, it was the, uh, you know, the result of government. By uh, 2012, we've actually moved away from that and I'll explain why. The biggest change has been an increase in accessibility to 24-hour overseas TV stations and services. Whether these are accessed through pay TV or other subscription services or whether they are received through satellite directly into the homes after the purchase and installation of three metre high receiving dishes. You would have seen them right through Petersham. They're everywhere. In fact, Maricourt Council has tried to actually um, abolish them. The reality is that ethnic communities had to have and had direct, unfettered and constant access to home country TV. Radio has also become more diverse with three to air channels in Sydney and Melbourne serving the Italian, Greek and Arabic speaking communities. Strong narrow cast audiences for Chinese language stations, a strengthening of community broadcasting into more channels and the maintenance of what I call the EB network, 4EB, 5EB, 6EB, which are the multilingual broadcasters in uh, the Baf uh, Brisbane, uh, Adelaide, Perth, as well as 3ZZZ and 2000 FM in Sydney. Uh, they were key in this area. The recent rescheduling of language programs in SPS is reflecting of the changes in, in the needs and capacities of diverse communities. Under the new schedule, SPS will expand the total number of languages it offers from 68 to 74. And I know there are some communities who are quite upset about those changes. And I know I've taken some personal criticism about that. But my strong belief is it is indeed necessary to keep pace with the changes. Asian languages will be broadcast on SPS in April 2013. 
Malayalam, Hmong, Pashto. There will also be three new African languages with growing migrant and refugee communities, Dinka, Swahili, and Tigrinya. There is a growing digital online presence. Specific nest communities, including Chinese, Indian, Korean, and Vietnamese, also have popular Australian-based and social media websites. Press is showing signs of decline, and I think in terms of what I'm suggesting, this is really the case. It is um, the ability to access online editions of overseas titles has, in effect, cut out the middleman for many of these journals. There has also been a fading of government policy with regard to community to communication spend, which has seen the quota approach quietly fade, and the dual effect of the current immigration of people with English and digital literacy and the ageing of the post-World War II cohort is resulting in a decreasing market for printed newspapers. While newspapers are in decline, there is now a growing also ma magazine offer, which transcends language and goes directly to cultural relevance. These titles include the Chinese Let, which is targeted youth, Wealth Investor, an Australian Chinese magazine targeting Chinese businesses, the Greek Opay for second and third generation um, Greek speaking, or English speaking Greek heritage kids. Of course, these are available in both hard copy and online versions. But it's here I want to divert from a history lesson into some political and policy considerations. The political and policy positions that are currently at play make for a complex and somewhat ambiguous position for multicultural media. The first of these is the consideration of the Howard years and how they are perceived. In, and many of you have heard me in other environments. In many other areas of public policy, I have argued that the Howard years allowed a covert and systematic erosion of key infrastructure supporting multiculturalism. I'm not arguing that today. Interestingly, this was not the case when we considered the trajectory of multicultural media. The government of the time established a Ministerial Committee on Government Communications, MCGC. This committee was chaired by, at the federal level, the Minister for State and had a membership which brought, which though changing over the tenure of the government, contained a consistent voice of a guy called Petro Giorgio, and anyone who knows multicultural history will tell you. He was with the Australian Institute of Multicultural Affairs, which formed SBS quite extraordinary character. This committee insisted that every large-scale government communication campaign have a core component, and this was pr uh, procedurally embedded through the requirement of a 5% of media spend to be directed to ethnic media. And if you consider what was happening in the time with the wor work choices and the chains campaign and, 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 we are talking multiple, multiple millions of dollars, and 5% of that was significant in this smaller market. I would argue that this period was the high point for multicultural media, especially press, though radio was also a strong beneficiary. At the same time, in the public domain, neither the Prime Minister nor the government more generally either support or legitimised multiculturalism. And indeed, the main game was counting the times that we had as a game that the Prime Minister would mention the word, which he did rarely. I think it was once or twice in a 10-year period. At the same time, in the public domain, this ambiguity is important. Is that the bell? It's trying to be the yeah. All right, I have to hurry up. This ambiguity was really important. I've now got three minutes. Because in its own right, as a comment on how the me uh, meeting of ideology and political expediency played out, but it is arguably more important when considering the legacy it engendered. This legacy is the reality of the last five years in which the new government support for ethnic media has decreased dramatically. The specifics of this are, fol are as follows. The Rudd Labor government distinguished itself from the previous government by acting and substantially reducing government advertising expenditure. It immediately abolished the government communication unit and set up its own system. The lack of a political structure such as MCGC meant that the identification of the role of ethnic media and its resourcing was left to public servants more broadly. From my perspective, the removal of a political intervention allowed the resulting void to be filled by the legacy of the rhetoric, which was that multiculturalism was the visive and that in reality ethnic groups had the same needs as everyone else and therefore did not require special treatment. It also allowed the void to be filled by other priority groups such as Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, women, people in rural and remote areas and refugees for which the bureaucracy needed to respond. That was their prevailing political pressure. This may seem a big call, but having lived through this change both as an advocate and a supply consultant, this was the new reality. Increasingly, core components were removed from communication briefs. There was, for the first three years of the Labor government, also no policy environment to drive this area, and the general acceptance that multiculturalism was a negative permeated bureaucratic policy, thinking and action. And the evidence this was substantial. The social inclusion framework specifically excluded the consideration of ethnic communities as 
needs that needed to be considered and still refuses to accept that the lack of English language is one of the most significant barriers to all levels of participation. Our social inclusion policy does not acknowledge this. How can it? How can it not? The minimum quota policy was quietly removed and there is now no policy setting guiding this area at the federal level. Similarly, in state jurisdictions, the level of support for ethnic media has waned and the quota, even where existing, have not been met. Your comments at the start were really apt. We have had these mechanisms in place, but we have not achieved them. And no one's asking the question as to why, because they're absolutely essential. The only other things, and I, I want to wrap up now and I'll go straight to the end of the presentation. While the political and tactical ba battle has been playing out, a new reality has developed in terms of where people access their media and the content of that media. This reality looks like this, a far stronger use of digital and other media channels cons to consume overseas media in all forms. A reduction in more traditional forms of media and the development of a new dichotomy between those ethnic communities who are digitally li literate and those who are not, with this latter group almost exclusively knowing what is happening in Lisbon, Belgrade, Naples, while at the same time possibly not being aware of the floods in Queensland or the current interests of the New South Wales ICAC. A more fragmented and disaggregated media in which media strategy moved beyond the press and radio now requires a more considered and sophisticated understanding of ethnic media segments. I was going to continue on in terms of what I think is the end point and the one that we should be concentrating on. Unless we have an Australian-based media going into ethnic communities, that notion, and, and the governor mentioned it, of democracy is at question. Can we allow ourselves to have a community where people take all of their information from overseas sources. If we do that, then we are in jeopardy. And I think our political imperative needs to be to ensure that the resources and the support is there, deliberate support of ethnic media, to retain the capacity for Australians to talk to Australians. Thank you. <laughs>